first of all, I'd like to say thank you uh, to Dr. Curry, eminent scientist, perhaps not as a matter of her desire, but something of a controversialist too, especially on the predominant topic of our times, the one that's been present, I think, for at least three decades in its full bloom, and that is, of course, global warming <coughs> or climate change. As a general introduction, I'll just take a line from, uh, I believe I found it on your own blog, when, when you were referencing the considerable discussion about the need for an energy transition, which is one of the great dogmas of the environmentalist. You also said, or wrote, that the climate debate also needs a transition from ideology and wishful thinking to facts, figures, and rationality. Uh, that doesn't seem like a strange statement to me at all, but I would think that a lot of people who are dedicated to the cause, they would find that a very startling thing to say that we need to have a change uh, from ideology and wishful thinking when they have insisted since 2000 at least, uh, the famous phrase, the science is settled. Uh, ex expand on your thought there, please. Well, the climate science is an extremely complex problem. The Earth's climate system is massively complex. Um, again, the data is never adequate. We don't have data going back far a lot, you know, going back far enough. Um, our understanding is incomplete how we should link together all this information. There are many different ways to reason about it. So it's not surprising that people disagree about what's going on, what has been going on, and what will happen with the climate. Um, that said, there's a monolithic <laughs> uh, sort of knowledge monopoly um, that's put forward to the public. I mean, and this is mostly from the IPCC, and I don't want to blame the IPCC entirely. Um, it, it, they get it from two ends. One is their master, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. You know, if, if the IPCC isn't deemed useful to them, you know, they pretty much go out of business. Um, and then on the other end, they have people who misinterpret it or cherry pick conclusions and information for their own political purposes. So, I mean, if you dig deep in the weeds of the IPCC reports, there's a lot of good things there um, and a lot of appropriate caveats and uncertainties and whatever. But by the time it makes it to the summary for policymakers, you know, the conclusions have been cherry picked and they're generally overconfident. Um, uh, so the problem is that we, pray, we frame the whole problem of climate change much too narrowly. Um, the IPCC treats it only as a CO2 control knob issue. They don't look at natural climate variability. Um, they regard natural climate variability as noise. Well, I regard it as the <laughs> signal. Um, so, and even if we had perfect understanding of the climate system, um, what we should actually do about warming temperatures is a whole other situation. And trying to decide what's dangerous I mean, that's a value problem. Most people like warmer temperatures. Um, sea level's a concern, but it, I mean, a slow creep of sea level rise, we can certainly adapt to that. Um, you know, so I think the weakest part of the whole argument is, you know, is all this dangerous, at least in the near term? And I don't think it is. Well, um, go on. I just got to wonder, one of the aspects of it, this is probably more sociological than scientific. But why is it that this particular cause, and there's, you know, there's tens and hundreds of them out there, uh, within its advocates, attaches itself to such great certitude, not certainty, certitude, and, and it's held with almost a ferocity. And if, if people like yourself or people who don't count like me would make a challenge of it, uh, the response is, is really quite surprising for what should be <clears throat> in an ideal world, 
really an academic question, if, if it's a question at all. Why, why is there such a force behind this, this issue? Okay, well, it's a, like you say, it's a complex sociological, you know, it's a contract between the scientists and the policymakers, the journalists, the whole, there's a social contract there that operates to the benefit of everybody. Um, back in the 1980s, the UN Environmental Program was looking for something to advance its agenda. It was anti-capitalist, anti-fossil fuels, pro-environment, pro-world government, anti-capitalist, things like that. And the climate change problem, you know, seemed to fit the bill. And so they started pushing it and they were one of the two sponsors of the IPCC. So the first IPCC assessment report in 1990, they concluded, well, we don't see anything here above beyond natural variability. Okay, but that was, <laughs> That didn't matter. Uh, the policymakers in 1992, there was the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. This is a big international treaty. Even the US signed this one to avoid dangerous anthropogenic climate change. So this was happening, you know, before there was any evidence of warming that could be attributed to humans. So it's out there in front. Um, the scientists like it. Um, Again, it generates a lot of research funding. They get a lot of press and media attention. Um, yeah. They get rewards from their university. They get seats at the big policy tables. So it's rewarding to the scientists. And it plays into, you know, a strain of environmental activism that was already pre-existing before this issue came along. And it's been a very clever marketing you know, and, and the thing, that, the only reason people care about this is that they've identified extreme weather as being caused by climate change. And this really happened with Hurricane Katrina. Yes. <laughs> this, is, this is actually when I got pulled into the public debate on climate change. Um, you know, for the first time, you know, if hurricanes were getting more intense and damaging like that, you know, for the first time, people thought one or two degrees temperature increase could actually make a difference and cause a lot of damage. And so I think the advocates and the activists seized on that. And now every storm, even the catastrophic cold outbreak that we saw in the Southern US, Texas. I was going to notably, ask you, yes. The past week, oh, that's global warming. <laughs> oh yeah, right. Uh, tell that to people who just, you know, endured record cold temperatures. Um, so, so they've seized on this and people buy it. Um, people I've want never to... seen, uh, I've played around in, in Canadian news for a fairly long while and I, I've seen political causes or environmental causes because I think they're a mix of two. I've never seen something that has received such a level of, of public endorsement. It is almost like if you did have a, a skeptical or a curious eye, uh, on the projections that are being made and the predictions of absolute doom if emissions don't go down, uh, it's almost like you're being shunned. So there's something, and maybe I'm over elaborating a point that's not interesting, but there seems to be something about this. Maybe it's the idea that you're championing the rescue of the entire world that gives this what we wish we would probably call an almost religious overtone. I know others have made that observation. But in newsrooms, as you pointed out, in universities, even in dinner parties, <laughs> climate change is the kind of subject you want to avoid like 50 years ago. You might have wanted not to talk about sex over the tape. It's a curious thing. Yeah, it is. Um, and it, it's so, climate is ubiquitous and you know, it's everywhere and you can you know, manage to blame just about everything on it you know, with, with the flimsiest justification. So it really is an ideal sort of <laughs> vehicle for all these political aspirations, really. What do you think of, uh, we have it up here in spades, uh, the commitment to uh, particular years and percentages 
of the reduction of carbon emissions, which means essentially you've, you've got to change industrial habits if nothing else, or you've got to oh. shut some down. Are these things, do these things have any possibility of okay, being that's... either accurate in terms of when they're going to occur or to have the effect that, what can Canada do to change the state of the planet in 2100? Well, it's worse than that. People are talking about targets in 2030, <laughs> you know, and 2050, you know, carbon neutral by 2050, 80% reduction by 2030, you know, all this, you know, the, these targets and timelines are meaningless in terms of, you know, the level of uncertainty that we have about how the planet might warm is huge, which makes these timetables ta meaningless. But the fact of, you know, with all these, with all this storm and drang and hot air, you know, in these UN framework convention meetings and everything like that, the Paris Agreement, at the end of the day, not much is happening um, in most places. Surpri <clears throat> Surprisingly, the U.S. has done pretty, pretty well at reducing its emissions yeah. yes. through the, yeah, through the transition to natural gas away from coal. But again, yes, I regard that as a good thing, but um, the activists don't like that because natural gas is a fossil fuel. And the only thing the activists hate worse than fossil yeah. fuels is nuclear. <laughs> Which is the solution, I presume. <laughs> Which is the solution. Yeah, the next generation nuclear looks really good, like molten salt reactors and stuff like that. And that's where we should go. So, you know, the so if we're got, I agree we need a 21st century energy infrastructure, not just sort of yeah. extending the old 20th century, but wind and solar are not the answer. In most regions, they don't make sense and they actually lock in coal and gas because you have to have, be able to ramp up yeah. and ramp down. Um, if you go completely nuclear, then wind and solar really add nothing to the table. Um, so we've got stuff that just doesn't make sense and, and you can't run an industrial 21st century economy on wind and solar. It's just not close. Well, it's very interesting. As you say, you can't run an industrial economy. One of the first things under your new administration, the Biden administration, that has a direct connection with my country, Canada, is that the long tormented Keystone XL <clears throat> The announcement of its cancellation was one of the highest priority items. It was a first day announcement. And it means, at least from, from our perspective, there are no pipelines out of our oil and gas. How, how much longer can countries pursue things, modern countries, that on any scale of common sense is, is an injury to employment and economy in the, in the pursuit of something that, if you're being honest, at least is very vague? Um, well, that's why not much has really been happening, unless you have a really zealous uh, head of country. Um, that's why I don't think at the end of the day, not much is really happening on all this. Um, and the countries who act too aggressively on this will lose out economically. Um, so it's a very delicate kind of situation. Um, as to exactly how this is going to play out in the U.S., I yeah. don't know. Um, <laughs> we have to see, um, you know, to how much Biden can actually do just by presidential decree rather than getting Congress buy-in and the Supreme Court, you know, to, to survive any challenges to the Supreme Court. We just have to see how it plays out. And then, you know, he has probably only two years to get something done because one of the houses of Congress will probably flip in 2022. Um, you know, so he doesn't have long, I don't think, to really get much done on this front. Um, you know, beyond R&D, you know, the, the new cabinet member for, the, for energy, um, has some interesting plans. I mean, these could 
do something useful, but we, what we need is a 21st century grid uh, and we need 21st century technologies. And provided that we can keep energy secure, reliable, and inexpensive, I mean, let's try to make it clean while we're at it. But, um, yeah. you know, the, the reliability and security is really paramount, as people in Texas sort of would now agree. Uh, it would be very interesting to see how the situation in Texas plays out. Um, you, you, you're, you yourself are a scientist. Uh, I've read up uh, some of your biography. Where, where was the moment, uh, because I don't mean this in a derogatory sense, you certainly are an outlier on this topic. Where, where did you first, if I can use this term, wake up that perhaps on a scientific scale, uh, the story being outlined by the IPCC and by the various advocacy organizations uh, didn't really deserve the name of science, but it was certainly under the flag of science that much of the persuasion was being done. Okay, a little bit of personal history. In about, I would say 2003, I was making presentations in academic circles and various committees that I sat on about, I was concerned about the way the IPCC was dealing with uncertainty. Um, and, and they just talked about, you know, all this the IPCC cared about was how to communicate it. And I said, no, it's not about communicating, it's about fundamentally understanding. <laughs> okay, understanding what you don't know. <laughs> You know, what are the uncertainties? How bad are they? How are they influencing your conclusions? Realistically, what kind of a confidence level should we have? So I started talking about that in 2003. And that was people say, yeah, okay, okay. They didn't quite get it. But, you know, I was still sitting on all these fairly prestigious committees and, mm -hmm. you know, having my say. Um, 2005, again, back to Hurricane Katrina. I was co-author on one of the papers that showed that the number, the percent of category four and five hurric hurricanes had substantially increased since 1970. Okay, so I was a co-author on that paper. Yeah. Um, you know, we didn't say it was global warming, we didn't say whatever, but that really put me out there in the public, you know, on this whole deba debate, and I was sort of categorized as an alarmist for talking about this issue. Yeah. Um, I then started to understand the social dynamics of what was going on. I was adopted by all the enviro advocacy groups. And I, and all this made me uncomfortable in terms of yeah. how they were behaving and how they were operating. And at the same time, I started um, participating in some of the skeptics blogs, you know, just to have a dialogue, just to see what that was all about. And so the big turning point was really the climate gate emails in November of 2009. This was the unauthorized release of emails from the University of East Anglia Climate Research Unit. Mm -hmm. And this was email exchanges among a number of authors of the IPCC reports and, and also Michael Mann and all the inside scoop about the hockey stick and everything like this. Uh, I read those emails and I was absolutely appalled. I was absolutely appalled. I said, if this is the kind of sausage making that goes into the IPCC, you know, I want, you know, nothing to do with it. And I started speaking out critically of the climate community. And again, I wasn't so much arguing about the science, the details of the science. Anything I've had to say about the science in the last 20 years is well within probably the likely bounds of the IPC team more on the lower end, but it's well within the bounds. But my, it's my criticism of the behavior of the climate scientists in term, terms of avoiding Freedom of Information Act requests for their data, um, shunning skeptics and trying to sabotage them, um, trying to rig peer review, trying to circumvent the internal rules of the IPCC in order to get unpublished things, you know, to be considered. 
and on and on it went. And bullying, you know, that was apparent in terms of a few individuals browbeating anybody they disagreed with and starting to sabotage people. And that this was like the early version of cancel culture. <laughs> you know, yeah, it was. It was. It, it was there in the climate gate emails, you know. <laughs> so while this has only really, you know, become a broad issue, say in the last five years, <laughs> the, the climate advocates, you know, were doing this, you know, 15 years ago. Um, so I began speaking out and in 2010, I started my own blog to really discuss all the uncomfortable questions you know, what do we disagree about? Let's talk yeah. about it, <laughs> you know? Um, and I started delving into not just climate science, but the social psychology, law, philosophy of science, you know, many economics, um, many different aspects of the whole debate. And so uh, I began to develop a fairly unique perspective. And at the same time, um, I started my own company, which is called Climate Forecast Applications Network. And I started dealing with people who were making real decisions. I mean, mostly corporations, but some governments, um, you know, trying to help them with weather or climate information that would help them make their decisions. And a big mm -hmm. part of that is, is uncertainty. I mean, <laughs> understanding what we don't know and looking at the historical range of what has happened, giving them a broad range of scenarios, trying to understand what their decision sensitivities are and trying to give them meaningful information. So since I span from weather to climate, I mean, I, I come with a very different perspective, um, a very different understanding of forecast uncertainty and how often forecasts go wrong. So, you know, I have a very different perspective than most of the other people out there talking about climate change. Well, one, one of the main instruments, you'll be able to judge if it is the main instrument of climate forecast, not weather forecast, is of course the construction of various models. And even a complete layperson fool like me realizes that Climate uh, over time is a hyper complex, massive system. And I'd like to get your view. I, I, I know what it is because I've read your stuff, but I'd like to have you express it here. <clears throat> What's the significance of modeling as the instrument of climate science? And of what value is it when dealing with a system as complex as the climate? Okay, the, the, when people talk about climate models, they mostly mean the general circulation where they model all of the atmospheric and oceanic circulation, the ice sheets, the land surface processes, and so on. And this is indeed a massively complex simulation models. Um, billions of degrees of freedom you know, there, there's no way you could ever tune a model like this to give you exactly the right answer. There are just so many, many variables and so many degrees of freedom. Um, these models, at least the atmospheric part, has their heritage from weather models. It's the same basic dynamical core and they inherit some credibility from weather models, you know, which are useful out maybe 10 days, two weeks. Um, but different things come into play in the atmosphere, like water, you know, the details of the thermodynamics and the water vapor accumulation and the ephotrophosphere, certain processes, I mean, that kind of stuff makes no difference on weather time scales, but, and, and details of how clouds interact with particles in the atmosphere. These things matter on climate time scales, but not on weather time scales. So a lot of the relevant processes are different on the climate versus the weather scale. Mm -hmm. So we have these climate models and they get increasingly, increasingly complex. Now they add, you know, ocean biogeochemistry and on and on it goes. Um, does the complexity make them more realistic? Well, not necessarily. It just gives them many more dimensions of possible uncertainties and crazy sources of feedbacks that can send the model off into la-la land. Um, so more complexity doesn't necessarily help, but that's the way the field is going. 
Okay, that's it. The climate models are interesting tools for trying to understanding how the climate system works. You turn off this process, you turn it on, you specify something in uh, the Pacific Ocean and see how the global climate reacts. You know, these kind of games, you can play games with these climate models to understand um, how the models work and maybe get some insights in how the climate system works. But if you're trying to predict the future climate, you know, no, these models are totally not fit for the task. And the models don't adequately treat natural climate variability. So you can't really use them to separate out what's mm. natural versus climate, because there's a lot of natural stuff that they just don't include. Um, so, you know, all these, and then there's a lot of different climate models and they build a big ensemble of simulations. Some models are better than others, but there's really no objective way to evaluate them because they're so complex and the observations just aren't adequate. So we're left with just mm -hmm. this bunch of climate models that we don't quite know how to interpret or evaluate. Um, but, but it's on, it's on the projections of those models, which as you have described and, and others of, of high scientific repute have, have basically said the same thing as you that whole governments, I mean, ours up here, I presume Mr. Biden's now that there's been a change there uh, over in Europe, that they're, they're, they are fantasizing about reorganizing their entire economies and disrupting, in my judgment, uh, the lives of very many people who are not protected by high position or power. And I wonder if 20 years from now, people and particularly real scientists look back on this period and wonder what damage a they've done to the to, well, probably the greatest discipline of the human mind certainly the most productive and its reputation and prestige and what politicians of course they'll be gone who toyed with the foundations of the prosperity of, of their own economies and their own countries and left it in some sort of a wreck because if they win and by which i mean if you banish fossil fuels which is the cry up here uh, it would be a great win for them, but a great loss for everybody else. Uh, you know, I think if things were just going to take its course, I think over the next hundred years, the use of fossil fuels would diminish. I think in the short term, you know, in more developed countries, I mean, they always want to go to cleaner, more reliable, yep. whatever. And I think that's nuclear <laughs> right now, or maybe something really far out you know, new technologies, um, hydrogen, whatever. So I think there would be a natural migration away from fossil fuels, although in the short term, the energy poverty regions like Africa and some of South Asia, they really need grid electricity, you know, just for to support human development, their safety, their economy, whatever. So we need to do that. And I think they have coal resources. It's hard to imagine how they're going to do this without coal. Unless, especially, and then the World Bank won't fund any coal-related projects. So they're just left uh, yeah. to get in bed with China. <laughs> won't fund that stuff, you know. So what kind of geopolitical sense does this make? Um, so, you know, the, the natural transition is to just let everybody get electrified and then slowly move towards cleaner fuels. And that would happen in the 20th century. We're, we're trying to speed that up a lot. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so they think the answer is wind and solar. <laughs> which Texas. basically Okay, which basically locks in 20th century technologies and also locks in your need for coal or natural gas <laughs> <laughs> to supplement it, you know, as the wind and solar fluctuates. So it just makes no sense. So, a, a, sorry, go on. Go please. on. No, you go ahead. So, uh, I was just going to say we've, we've adverted uh, once or twice here to nuclear power. This, this is a particular question. Uh, I, I often think of it this way. If, if your warnings are serious, and I'll assume that they are, and that the future, as they say, of mankind is at stake, what possible superior objection could you have to the use of nuclear power? And therefore, why is it either in logic or otherwise rejected by those who are most alarming? 
you, you got to wonder what's going on in their heads. The people who are most vocal climate change activists, the only thing they hate worse than fossil fuels is nuclear. Okay, so what do they care about? I don't think it's the climate. <laughs> I, you know, I just don't know. They have some vision of, oh, you know, I wish they wish it was 1600 again. <laughs> you know, and <laughs> there weren't very many people and, you know, humans weren't, you know, polluting the earth or whatever. I don't know. Um, it makes no sense. Um, but these are the people who have a lot of political power. Well, as, as a last thing, I won't steal much more of your time. I just, this is going back, I think, again, to the beginning and the strain of irrationality, at least I, I claim, is present in this particular cause. I found it, it, not disparaging the individual, but I found it rather amusing that the 16-year-old Greta uh, could meet with the leaders of the world. She sat down with our prime minister. I believe she addressed your Congress in the most furious and uh, disparaging tone. How dare you? <laughs> We're in the 21st century. This is the most complex assembly of sciences, which is what global warming science is. It is a vast structure of sciences. And uh, we make a Joan of Arc of uh, a 16 year old who is repudiating her elders. Where are we wandering with this stuff? <laughs> well, okay. Greta, in one way, is fairly remarkable. <laughs> <laughs> that she, I agree. <laughs> she's remarkable. But that said, you know, why people are paying attention to her, you know, her policy, but, uh, you know, she, she ties into people's agenda. Um, and people try to make the case, oh, we need to do this for the grandchildren. God knows it's not going to make any difference in our lifetime. And so, you know, she's a useful talisman is representing, you know, the future generation. So, you know, I don't know what people are thinking. <laughs> I think Greta's star is dimming a little bit. Um, I don't He's know. emitting less carbon right now. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Dr. Curry, uh, uh, I say, as I said at the beginning, I, I thank you very much for your attention and your time. I hope I haven't interrupted too much of your day. And it's always good to read your stuff. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you.